The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. versus humility. Now, I want to paint a picture for you at the start. Now picture this. The Israelites have been wandering in the wilderness. Forty years they wandered in the wilderness. What should have taken them only 11 days or so. Because of their attitude, they wandered for 40 years. In Numbers chapter 21, They have been wandering in the wilderness at this point for 39 years. They are beginning to make their move to the promised land. Miriam is dead. Aaron is dead. Most of those who were 20 years old when they left Egypt are dead. It's a new generation. At this time of transition, and the body of Christ, by the way, is at a significant time of transition. We are entering into something brand new. In Numbers 21, at this time of transition, the Lord led them to water, but it wasn't the way it had been before. Before in the wilderness wandering, Moses had spoken to the rock and rivers of water gushed out to give the millions of Israelites and their livestock to give them water in abundance. Now, in Numbers 21, verses 16 and 17, the Lord shows them where to dig a well. From now on, they had to work together and worship together and war together in unity. Last week, the Lord was speaking, gave the word through Donna and to, my, to us in our prayer time that there is a synergy. Dennis and I could feel it in our prayer time. There is a synergy. There is a one accord that's building. There is a t- place of critical mass that God is bringing us to. Now, what is a critical mass? It can be, in physics, the smallest mass of fissionable material that will sustain, start, and sustain a nuclear chain reaction at a constant level. For the past 2,000 years, most of the time, revivals have been very short-lived. Most of them have lasted no more than three or four years before they ebbed away. And of course, the church went back into worldliness gradually, and the, the effects were lost. But there have been several times when revival started and it was ignited and sustained for at least 100 years. This happened after the day of Pentecost. It was 100 years before we saw the church go into the start, the, to the stark decline as the whole world sank into the dark ages. All those things that had been living in the early church ebbed away until they became a distant memory and mental doctrine for the most part. Another time that a revival lasted 100 years was Bangor Bay in Ireland. It was said for hundreds of years it was called the Bay of Angels because there were the constant presence of angels and the prayers of the saints saints sustained for 100 years. The Moravian Pentecost in 1727, Count von Zinzendorf, the Lord brought them into the unity of John chapter 17, and it ignited a revival that was sustained for a hundred years. 24-7 prayer and worship came, ascended to heaven from that place, and it launched a a movement of missionaries that went out to the furthest reaches of the globe to take the news of the Spirit of God to the world. Now, 
critical mass can also be an amount or level needed for a specific result or new action to occur. God is bringing us to an adequate level of one accord. What's an adequate level of one accord to open a portal to release heaven on earth? I don't know, but God is taking us to that place. It took 10 days in the upper room. They didn't know how long they were going to be there. Many of them grew weary and left. But God is telling us to cooperate with him till he brings us to a necessary level of one accord that will open the windows of heaven, create a portal so the glory can pour through this place. How many prophetic words have we received about the waters that are going to flow forth and flood this re region with the presence and the glory of God out of this place? We're going to cooperate with God. So the Lord took me to this verse in Numbers 21, 21, 16 through 17. The children of Israel. Now it's a new generation. This is the Joshua generation. It says, from there they went to Beer, which means well in Hebrew. The word Beersheba means a place of the well. Which is the well where the Lord said to Moses, gather the people together. This is a time of gathering. God is saying, gather the people together, for I'm doing a new thing. And then Israel sang this song, spring up a well, all of you sing to it. John 4:14. 4, Jesus said to the woman at the well, the water that I shall give will become a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. This is not a well where you're going to have to dip a bucket down in the well and draw up the water. This is going to be an artesian well of the waters, of living water that's going to be released to give, to satisfy our thirst, but also bring healing to our land. In Hebrews 2, 10 through 13, did you notice what was happening in worship this morning? The Lord's saying this is the beginning of true corporateness for my body. It's going to be corporate worship. It's going to be corporate prayer. It's going to be corporate work. The Lord says, because I am breathing upon my body, raising them up as a mighty army and a living organism that will work as one, as moved by the Spirit of God. In Hebrews 2, 10 through 13, it says, For it was fitting for Father God, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory. It says in the book of Romans, All have sinned. And for 2,000 years, the church has mostly dealt with the sin problem. But there are two parts to that verse. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's all been about restoring the glory that was lost at the fall of man. God wants to restore the glory to sons and daughters, those that he's mature and raising up to move at the, at the behest of the Spirit of God to complete the works that God wants done on, the, on planet Earth. In bringing many sons to glory, and look at what happens for these sons who are brought to glory, these corporate Sabbath sons and daughters who are brought to glory. It says, both he who sanctifies who's Jesus, our sanctifier, and together with those who are being sanctified are all of one, unity. For which reason? He's not ashamed to call them brothers because they are brothers in every sense of the word. Corporate brothers, unified. Jesus prayed, oh, Father, that they may be one as you and I are one. They're brothers. 
Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. And that word good means fullness of joy. And that word pleasant means robes of glory or robes of splendor, clothed in robes of splendor because they're unified. And what does Jesus say about these who come into unity? He says, I will declare your name, Father, to my brethren in the midst of their assembly or their unified assembly. I, Jesus, will sing praise to you, my Father, here and the children whom God has given me. God wants a corporate expression so Jesus can flow through our voices by the Spirit and sing praises to Father God. This is the beginning of corporate equipping for the body of Christ. Not just our individual gifts, but our corporate gifts. And the first two equippings that God is doing is in corporate intercession where Jesus is praying by the Spirit through us directly to Father God. It's not hand-to-hand -hand combat of intercessors. It's... It's intercession from the Holy of Holies where I, our Father then does the warfare and we just speak out what Father God is doing as we pray. The second corporate equipping that God is doing simultaneously is corporate worship. I believe as we cooperate in this, he will bring us to critical mass. He will bring us to the necessary one accord our Father, not my Father, our Father. One drop of water versus many waters. One strand versus a weaving of strands to make a chair where the weight of the glory of God can rest. A heap of individual stones or a house of living stones built up as a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. What God has spoken to us However, is God wants to do the knitting, bonds of love, bonds of shalom with one another, and we can't love God and one another properly when we have idols, agendas, and soul ties. In the love book of the Bible, 1 John ends with these words. It's all about love, 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 love God, love one another, love God, love one another, and then the last sentence says little children keep yourselves from idols because you can't love God truly and you can't love one another truly when you have seducing spirits that attach to lust because you have idols agendas and soul ties not many months ago we were in our prayer time and God gave Dennis a vision and he saw the mighty warrior our Lord Jesus rising up and breaking through a slimy net like slimy spaghetti of the wrong connections. Mm -hmm. And Jesus rose up and broke through and those cords, those evil cords split and fell off. And what the Lord is doing now, he can, once we're free, he can knit us together the way he wants us to knit together to accomplish his purposes in our lives and on earth. Wrong connections must be broken for God to build us together as a house for his glory. And the verse that the Lord gave Dennis was Isaiah 42, 13. The Lord shall go forth like a mighty man. He shall stir up his zeal like a man of war. He shall cry out, yes, shout aloud. He shall prevail against our enemies. And what you see, you can have. God gives revelation, not for our information, but so he can bring a transformation and rise up as a man of war in us with a shout. Amen. Amen. Maybe after that, maybe I should be the, I should be the good guy. She's pretty hard. Demanding. But in reality... God has basically spoken to us to bring back to the simplicity of Christ. Actually, our whole ministry is the simplicity of Christ, learning Christ in us, the hope of glory. And we spent years trying to 
change the paradigm shift that we saw in the church. We would say, Christ in you, the hope of glory, and then ask the congregation, where's Jesus? 98% would point to heaven. Yes, he's in heaven. We just got done saying, Christ in you, the hope of glory. We are so prone to distance. It's almost implied by our very lifestyle. Um, I looked at the cover of a recent magazine, and they says, hearing from God. I don't know about you, but that's still small voices in me. It's on earth as it is in heaven. And that that needs to be changed to where we become more God inside minded. And if that's the case, God is bringing us to a place of unity. We're going to have to have a fresh new sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, an increase in the sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. But to bring it back to the simplicity of Christ, there's a lot of complicated things that you can teach and that you can learn. But in reality, pride is rooted in Satan. I like to get right down to root level and foundational level. Pride is rooted in Satan. Humility is rooted in God. So if we start from the proper place, the place to start in preparation is humility. When I was a young Christian and I wanted to go to Bible school, God wouldn't let me in the initial stages. And he told me, I'm going to take you, Dennis, to the school of the Spirit. And he took me to the place. And guess what the first thing he taught me was that the moment you close your eyes, you honor me. Not, it was a dry prayer time, or I didn't get nothing, or beat yourself because you didn't pray long enough, or hard enough, or you didn't read your Bible enough. Instead, he says, simply understand that this is about an intimate relationship with you and I. I don't want anything to come between what you and I have together. And honor is the place to start, and honor is impossible without humility. Humility is the starting place to where when you close your eyes, you honor him. And that that is a sufficient building block for the rest of your Christian life. And so I saw that at the most basic premise of everything that God's been promising us, and much of the confirmation is coming uh, from uh, uh, various sources in the body of Christ, that it's basically pride versus humility in, in the simplest form. And that if we're going to see God accomplish his purposes of unity, pride is the enemy to unity. And you say, where, where, where's that pride? Well, if pride's rooted in Satan and humility's rooted in God, then it's, it's the most basic premise uh, that will facilitate change. If you really want to change, it must start from the place of humility. And we must understand even what pride is. You know, pride doesn't see itself. That in itself is a problem, isn't it? Pride doesn't see itself. So it, it's going to require you humbling yourself before God and saying, search me, O oh God, search my heart. Reveal secret sins, as David said. Secret, they were secret to David, so he needed exposure. But intimacy with God and vulnerability opened them up to such a thing. Uh, uh, everyone's familiar with Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. You probably could quote that as a baby Christian. I like the message translation. First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. Let's say that back with me. First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the bigger, the harder the fall. Sometimes you just have to hear it in a different translation because we can get Bible hard to the stuff we have memorized. Uh, the message really gets me sometimes uh, to reevaluate certain heart matters. But pride says we're not so bad. We want to, let's unfold pride a little bit. Let's yield ourselves to that possibility. Pride says we're not so bad. Have you ever said, I'm not, I'm not so bad? I used to watch men get together in men groups, and they would, they would confess their issues one to another and felt they were making real progress. And then I found out that when you took it a little further, some of the men were saying, yeah, I opened up and said that I got a problem. Sometimes I get angry, but I'm not as bad as Ralph over there. I'll tell you what, he's in bad shape. And sometimes they use those group meetings rather than to press on into more to justify themselves that they're not, they're not that bad. You know what? We need to not compare ourselves among ourselves. We need to open our hearts up and say, you search me, God. Let's go by your standard, not me comparing myself with other men. All right? That's, it's good. I'm not saying that those groups are not good. I'm just saying you can fall short of the full intent, and that is allow God to search your heart for pride. Because pride will always say, I'm not so bad. Pride will agree 
When other people offer sympathy, it will like sympathy. Ah, pride will like that. Pride might even be open to assistance. You can help me if you want. I like the attention, but I'm not going to surrender. That's the voice of pride. Pride hide behind what will people think of me. That's why they don't confess their faults one to another. It's just me and God. It's just me and God. There's a, the majority of your Christian life should be just you and God. But in reality, if you ever get to the point where you never need anybody else other than you and God, you're already into the pride of superiority. Hmm? Pride will always try harder. Have you ever tried harder? Have you ever blown it and then said, I'm going to try harder? It isn't about you trying harder. Try, we even use that as an acronym in our training sessions, don't we? T-R-Y. Temporarily resist yielding to God. Try. To try is to temporarily resist yielding. It, the whole key to humility is that when I yield to Christ within, when I yield to Him, God works and wills according to His good pleasure. And it's like Jennifer says, this is not a well that is just kind of stagnant. This well is powerful, and when you open your heart to Christ within, it's like an artesian well. It flows. You don't need to uh, 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 try and make it flow. The minute you yield to God, He works and He performs according to His good pleasure, and His will is always His pleasure. You yield your will. Basically, you get out of the way, God will work. Isn't that true? You get out of the way. Well, how do you get out of the way? You yield your will. That's another thing. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Where's Jesus? I got to hear from God. That's a long distance phone call when you could could be local. You know, you could just go to the still small voice within. Then there's the other one where we would say, where's your will? And this included pastors. And we went to some of the best taught churches in New England. We'd say, where's your will? And they'd go like this. You're going to have difficulty living under the lordship of Jesus Christ if you think your will is here. The will is here. You yield your will. Even the Hallmark movies are more informed than some of the church people. I saw it on a Hallmark movie. They were giving romantic advice, and she says, go with your gut, go with your heart. They put the heart and the gut together in the same sentence. I'm going, that's a Hallmark movie. Those are people in the world. The people in the church think their heart is over here. Jesus did not come into your blood pumper. As a matter of fact, there's only one verse of Scripture that actually pertains to the blood pumper in the, in the whole New Testament, and that is that men's hearts will fail for fear. They'll actually have, you can, you can actually have fear to such a degree you die. You have heart failure. That's the only one that pertains to this. Everything else is the innermost being. This is your Bible heart. This is the gut, the belly where the rivers flow. This is Christ in you. This is the conscience. This is the seat of the emotions. This, everything good happens here except wait. Okay? <laughs> everything good happens right here. Except belly fat. All right, but other than that, pride will always try harder. Does that sound familiar? I can't believe I did that. Is that the voice of God? Mm, that's the voice of you in your exalted position. Can't believe. You can't believe you made a mistake. I like Brother Lawrence, who practiced the presence of God, who was classic in walking in a revelation that I've coveted my whole Christian life, to know that relationship that Brother Lawrence had. But Brother Lawrence would take barrels of wine into the marketplace, and he'd break half of them, and he would just say, oh, if it wasn't for the grace of God, I'd have broke all of them. (laughs) That's not the way we would respond, would we? What would pride say? I can't believe that I was so stupid that I broke that. Like, I am so superior to that kind of behavior. That mustn't have been me. Oh, so then we could do three other things. We could deny that it happened. What barrels? What broke? Eh, nothing broke. I found them like that. Rationalization. That's the others. I don't know. God must have wanted it to happen. Or the third one is, it was that guy's cart. 
He gave me a faulty cart, the barrels fell off, and it was his fault. Projection. We either deny rather than humble ourselves. We either rationalize or we project it on it's somebody else's fault. Well, guess what? The first thing that God did after the resurrection is he appeared to the people and said, go preach the forgiveness of sin. That means the blame game is over. That as a believer, you're no longer entitled to blame. The blame game is done. Go preach the forgiveness of sin. Luke 24, John 20. Go preach the remission of sin. I would think I would pay attention to what Jesus told me after he rose from the dead and came to me and I was one of his disciples and he goes, go preach the forgiveness of sin. I think I would take forgiveness and the remission of sin very seriously. Wouldn't you? Especially when it was a gift and my pride didn't have anything to do with it. Pride refuses to honor God as God. And isn't it interesting when God wouldn't let me, he said, I'm going to teach you to pray, Dennis. I'm going to take you to the school of the spirit in prayer. And that the most important thing that he taught me was the minute you close your eyes, you honor me. You cultivate that because actually humility before God is yielding to God, giving God his proper place, but it's also teaching you something that it's an attitude or a disposition of the heart so that later when you go to work, you honor those, you honor God more than the boss, more than the people. Because in everything you do, you're doing it as unto God, but you learn that in the intimacy of prayer to where you learn first and foremost, honor me. Samuel says, he that honors me, him shall I honor. And what's, what's interesting about this, pride, pride says, I have trouble trusting God. Have you ever said that? That's pride. What you're saying is, I trust me more than God. Well, good luck. Because the bigger the ego, the harder the fall. First pride, then the crash. <laughs> you know? But pride will not give God its rightful place and trust Him. Matter of fact, I made, a, I made a, 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 a head of a missions department angry with me for two hours, and then he came and repented because he was humble. But for two hours, I, he was all stressed out, and I said, you can't be trusting God and stressed at the same time. That's a spiritual impossibility. And he got angry. Err came back two hours later and said, you were right. <laughs> but it took him two hours to think that through. But in humility, he said, you're right. And you, the funny thing is, is when he said you were right, you confess your faults one to another, you might be healed. He felt a dimension of peace increase in his personal life from that point on and accomplished more with less effort. Anybody like that idea? Accomplish more with less effort. Yeah. But it is God who is at work both. Say both both to will and to perform. So how does he will and perform? You yield, God performs. Derek Prince, in the early years as a baby Christian, was the only person that I ever heard teach on yielding. Everyone else was, be a doer of the word, not a hearer. Be a doer, and I saw people striving and burned out everywhere. And Derek Prince says, the grace of yielding, because it's an ability that you have in your will to yield to him, he starts to work, and that's where grace comes. And grace is the supernatural empowerment to be and to do, unless you don't want to be or do. Or you say, I can be and do by myself. I can do it for God, as opposed to allowing God to be working in me. Pride always allows life to revolve around you rather than God. The wrong center, don't you think? Pride keeps self on the throne. Pride leads to a reprobate mind. Now, that's a pretty strong, powerful word, and we don't even talk about that in the church anymore. But I've watched it as a pastor, and it's grieved me that I've always prayed, are they so far gone that they cannot come to their senses? Because they really don't see it. When you start moving toward reprobate, it's because God is so much no longer God that you've compromised for such a long time period of time, that if God is no longer God, then guess how that translates? Sin is no longer sin. And you start making and evaluating a pseudo-Christianity because sin is no longer sin, because God is no longer God. You violated His, His nature and His commands 
for such a long period of time, you don't think there's anything wrong. You start calling the ditch the road and the road the ditch. And our society is living there right now. And we don't want to be affected by our society. They're calling evil good and good evil. That is a sign that that is the, what we must war against in the church. And the simplicity and returning to the simplicity of Christ, we're going to have to go at root level of that the real battle is humility or pride. It is that simple in the simplicity of Christ that we can make a choice. But because pride has a way of hiding, we're going to have to ask God to search our heart, not we ourselves. You will justify yourself. You will rationalize. You will deny. You will say, what's wrong? What did I do? Pride leads to a reprobate mind. If God is not God, then sin is no longer sin. What the Bible calls sin, you no longer call sin. You just keep up your churchianity activities, but you don't pay any attention to what the Bible calls sin anymore because you've already redefined it. That is a spirit of pride. Pride convinces its most obedient slaves that they're free. Hey, before I got saved, I thought I was free. I tried everything because I wanted to find personal happiness. And so freedom for me was to do whatever I wanted. I thought I was free. But if there is, I didn't believe this, but if there is a spiritual realm, that realm has dominion over your carnality. So even though I thought I was free, I didn't realize how unfree I was until I tried to stop certain habits that I wanted to do. All of a sudden, when I went to stop what I wanted to do, I found out I couldn't stop what I wanted to do. That arrested my attention quickly. And that was a good thing because that caused me to humble myself and ask God for help and open the door. Humility is rooted in God. Pride is rooted in Satan. But here's the part that simply amazed me. And that was Proverbs 22.4. I was only a baby Christian when I heard this scripture for the first time, and it's impacted me ever since. It shows the, the, the futility of living by pride and in your own strength. Proverbs 22.4 says, By humility and the fear of the Lord, which I saw that as reverence or honor, by humility and honoring God are riches, honor, and life. So wait a minute. That's what I was trying to get before I was saved. Riches, depending on how you interpret that. Riches, honor. I want to, be, I want to find out who I am. I'm still trying to find myself. My generation always went to California on a Harley to find out who they were. And then they got there and found out they were still the same person, only they were in California instead of Pennsylvania. All right? I want to find out who I am. I want to know, I want to, I want to have a life. Was there anyone who did not pursue wanting to have a life with a capital L? So I didn't know what that meant, so I just pursued everything. I was so desperate to find out something that would make me happy that when the parties didn't work and the drugs didn't work, I turned to research. I didn't have a whole lot of money, but I ordered a periodical magazine on every subject in the world, knowing that I was going to read these magazines and there was going to be a topic that was going to jump out and say, Dennis, this is for you. And I never found the topic. I only knew what I didn't want, religion. I think God had the last word on that one, didn't he? I don't want religion. I, I want, I'm going to be happy, but I don't want that religion. And God basically opened up, opened up my life. And while I was mocking a TV evangelist, in the middle of mocking him, he pointed his finger at me and suddenly it was like the world came crashing down around me. He was talking to me and only me. And I gave my heart to the Lord at that point even in the midst. So if you don't go the way of humility, you can go the way of humiliation. <laughs> but I, I truly recommend humble yourself so that God can extend grace to you. All right? So by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. 
Isn't that something that by humility, God gives you life with a capital L. He gives you riches, honor, both in this life and in the life to come. He resists the proud, however, but he gives grace to the humble. Again, let's go back at grace. Grace is not just unmerited favor. Grace is the personal presence of Jesus enabling, and let's use this word, empowering you to be and to do all that he called you to be and all that he called you to do. So in other words, grace is the ability for God to work in you to will and to perform according to his good pleasure for you to be and for you to do all that he called you to be, all that he called you to do. That's a good deal, isn't it? Or we can do it ourselves. That's called pride. All right? But he resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. So the spirit is jealous. And this is what God showed us. And Jennifer shared how God gave me that revelation in Isaiah 42 about Christ breaking through that that it was like a slimy net. And that slimy net was agendas, attachments to idols, person, place, or thing, soul ties. And God says, I'm about to break through as a warrior. And this also changed our intercession quite a bit. I'm going to break through as a warrior. And by the way, out of all the names of God, and all those names of God that as even a baby Christian, I walked in a relationship until I knew those names of God intimately. If he was Jehovah, my shepherd, I walked with him to what it would be like for him to be my shepherd and how would I behave during the day as a sheep to the shepherd. And I walked experientially. But the one that God is speaking now since the beginning of the year is uh, Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. That in your Bibles, that the various names of God, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah, okay, are 20 to 30 times but 290 times is Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of the hosts. And I believe that God is militantly preparing a way for us that if we would cooperate, we would see victories in the impossible areas, areas that up until now, some people wouldn't even have uh, the faith to believe for. And quite frankly, one is standing before you today. Christians told me that Dennis was so bad. I'm going to say, how bad was he? Dennis was so bad that there were Christians that said, well, I'm not praying for him. I'm going to pray for someone that's a little more likely to become a Christian. Isn't that something? I was one of those. And you don't want to pray for him. He's a lost cause. God has the last say in that, doesn't he? But in, but the spirit is jealous for us. And that's what I believe God is saying. Now, when I say God is jealous, some people have a hard time with God is jealous. No, God is jealous in that he's singular in his purpose and in his love and his passion. He's singular in his love for us. But it says in James 4, adulterers and adulteresses, Those are people with idols, agendas, and soul ties. Do you not know that friendship with the world is at enmity with God? That means you're battling against God himself. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy to God. The spirit in you that dwells for you yearns jealously. He wants your undivided attention. He wants your singular purpose. The first revelation that God gave me out of eight stages in that school of prayer besides honoring him was when he began to speak to me for weeks and months at a time and never changed the subject. And he said, Dennis, I'm giving you my undivided attention. And I, just, I would just weep before the Lord because as my, my entire life, to my father, I was invisible. I grew up invisible. He was invisible to his father, kind of went right down the line. And all of a sudden, God is telling me something that I had no reference to. I didn't know what it was like. And he said, I'm giving you undivided attention. That means even while you're asleep, you're the apple of my eye. You're the center of my attention. And what it did was eventually my heart just burst and I wanted reciprocity. Oh God, I want to return. How do I, how do I give you back? I can't think of you constantly. And then God broke something that, I, that I've cherished ever since. It's almost like I kept thinking, I've got to drop down into your presence. I've got to get in your presence. Then I'm back up into my head. Then I've got to drop down. Then I'm back up in my head. Then I'm back. And God says, it's not a product of your mind 
It's a product of your spirit. You can commune with me constantly. You can pray unceasingly. And it was like he cut a cable to my bucket. And it's been down ever since. It's basically what I call dual awareness. I'm aware in my mind. You don't throw your mind out. But while you're using your mind, you're always simultaneously aware of whether or not the peace of God is ruling. If the peace of God is ruling on the inside, Jesus is ruling. If peace is ruling, he's Lord. And if peace is ruling, you're at least walking in the light that you have. Doesn't mean you don't need more light. You stay humble before the Lord and you stay open and he will guide you and teach you. You'll make better decisions. You'll see fruitfulness in, in every endeavor of life because peace will guide your path in Christ Jesus. But the most beautiful thing he ever did for me was to say, Dennis, don't let anything come between what you and I have together. What that means is that anything that interrupts your peace is coming between you and God. Anything. Irritation. That's how I learned in a tangible way, Christ was the forgiver in me that I didn't forgive people. I yielded to Christ the forgiver who alone can forgive through me. And I found out that when I would let Christ go to my pain, it changed to peace. And that I knew that whatever was between us was gone. And then I, would, I got a reputation as a counselor. I never tried to be a counselor, but I got a reputation. But I in hindsight, I know what happened. You know what happened? People would come in and say, I could discern their spirit because I'm at peace. Peace precedes your perception. And, I'd say, and they'd say, well, I'm just here, Pastor, today. I forgave my husband. And that's the way it would feel in my gut. I forgave my husband. Even though they'd say, I forgave my husband. <laughs> but in my gut, and I'd say, well, maybe we ought to just take that to prayer anyway. I'd find a tactful way to say, I think your lips don't match your heart, all right? <laughs> and by doing that, eventually then, I'd say, let's let, let Christ in you take that pain or that hurt towards your husband. Does he take our pain and our sorrow? He most certainly does. And then when he takes it, it changes the peace. And they say, yeah, I forgave my husband. And I'd feel a mild, very mild anointing on it. And I say, that's it. And I got a reputation as a counselor when in reality, all I was doing was making a distinction between lip service and heart service. You can say, well, with their lips they praise me, but their heart is far from me. And when you make that distinction, all of a sudden you have integrity before the Lord. So anyway, that's our choice. God is basically saying he yearns jealously for us. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinner, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. God sets himself against the proud and the haughty, but he gives grace continually, and that's what we're pursuing. Continually means a flow out of uh, the vision God gave us that he says, Dennis, I'm going to teach you how to plant churches, but before you plant a corporate church, I'm going to teach you how to be the temple. And what he taught me was that he wanted this temple to have an atmosphere of love, acceptance, and forgiveness. So now I've got to teach Dennis in this temple love, acceptance, and forgiveness. Then I'm going to teach him the priority of, of, first of all, built on the proper foundation that it's a relationship with Christ, no other foundation, intimacy. And then intimacy must lead to transformation, and transformation must lead to application. And when that application flows out of you, just as it did in Ezekiel chapter 47, that the waters would flow from the base of the temple, and out of your belly would flow rivers of living water, out of this temple and out of the corporate temple. And basically, I planted my first church, actually even built a dome church, not that it was necessary because it was more a pattern and a principle that needed to be from the heart. First this temple, then the corporate temple. And God is now saying that we're entering a season where the waters are flowing from the base of the temple. First to trickle, first to the ankles, then to the knees, then to the waist, then you swim in it. I want to swim. I don't know about you. I want to go for the whole thing. So God is basically saying it's our choice. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. But you've got to cleanse yourself from double-mindedness. And when I did a word study a long time ago, is that uh, even uh, some of the uh, classical 
mystic Christians used to say, there is a law of central tendency that if you draw nigh to God, he comes running to you. Remember the father and the prodigal? The prodigal kind of shuffling his way home, saying, I'm, I'm, I gotta go back. I think I messed up bad. But the father came running toward him. So God says that when you drop down and you draw nigh to God, he draws up to you. This is the season. Jim Gall prophesied this over Jennifer and I, and we believe that this is the season for the magnet. The magnet both attracts and repels. That uh, lift up your eyes, sons and daughters are coming. It's going to be divine appointments become divine connections. Divine connections put you in divine order. Divine order causes you to corporately enter into divine purpose. This is too much for you, isn't it? Take notes. If you're watching by Ustream, write this all down as fast as I'm talking. (laughs) We release the gift of writing quickly. All right. If you get that gift, let me know. Um, But it's our choice. So basically what God is saying, put away, purify your hearts. And we're saying this, that it's a time of choosing. Now, I want to close with this illustration because this is the point of departure. It's the, it's the place of proper choice. How many know that there's a story of Elijah and Elisha, and there's also the story of Gehazi, the servant. Anybody know about him? Oh my goodness. It's a contrast of pride and humility. It's a contrast of greedy selfishness and honoring God. It's Elisha. Remember, even when Elijah was taken up, what did he say? My father, my father. He was a true son. And it even says that in the process of discipleship, Elisha poured water on the hands of Elijah. And actually, for that season, that was considered like women's work. That was really menial. And yet he was on, to honor the prophet Elijah, he did whatever to honor him. He that honors me, him shall I honor. That's the principle in the kingdom. Learn honor from the, from the, from the very basic step. Elisha learned that, did twice the miracles Elijah did, and then Elisha had a servant named Gehazi. Gehazi is a real character here. All of that exposure did not make him a great man of God, did it? No. It says, when Gehazi clean, cleansed Naaman of his leprosy and Naaman offered him rewards, he said, nah, never, never mind. I'm going to paraphrase. I'm going to tell this story instead of reading it from the Bible. And then Gehazi when he says, oh my God, he was offering him stuff and he told him no. He chased him down and said, uh, my master kind of changed his mind. I'll take some silver. I'll take some clothes. Uh, I'll take some of those garments. And then he came and he hid them in his room. And, and then Elisha comes in. Where did you go? What did you do? When you left Naaman, chariot, when he came down from his chariot and spoke, did not my spirit go with you? Didn't I know? And I saw how this works. You know how this works? Parents, you're going to love this. If you really want the best for your children, you will catch them. I mean, it is so cool. It's the coolest thing about being a parent. There's a lot of responsibility, a lot of difficult things that come with parenthood. But one of the coolest things is, is that in God, you can catch them. Didn't we? We were doing a meeting in North Carolina in the mountains, and it was supposed to be a three-day meeting, and at the second day, I said, I think my son's in trouble, not this one. I think my son's in trouble. Jennifer goes, hmm, we're going to have to find a way to apologize to these people tactfully, cut, the, cut it short, and we came, probably saved his life. I had to call the police and everything, and I went, story for another day. Then we had Allison, we had Jennifer's daughter, and I'm driving out of my subdivision, which you only can turn left to drive out of the subdivision, and the car turned right. And I started, for no reason, driving down right, not the way to exit the subdivision. And then this car with black windows, 
a door opened up and a leg. And I said, I know that leg. <laughs> that looks like an Allison leg. She had snuck to see her boyfriend and God caught her. And it's, it's not to punish. It's because admonition and nurture go hand in hand. God loves, he wants to bring you to the place of humility. And even literally pastoring 38 years, I've been in ministry, and I still see people, rather than humble themselves, hide. They run. They would be so much better off not running because I've never seen them get healed running. I've only seen them get healed by confess your faults one to another that you might be healed. But it's a matter of pride. What will people think if I were to say I was struggling but now I'm changed? Isn't it a shame? But I've watched it for 38 years and there's nothing you can do about it except pray for them that they come to their senses and like the prodigal return. And maybe your place of trouble becomes your door of hope. But I just saw that, that the Gehazi was offered the same, the same opportunity that Elisha was offered with Elijah. Isn't that sad that he basically wasted it because of pride? I've got a better idea. I don't want to serve Elisha. I'm going to serve myself and I'm going to get some rewards. I can't believe Elisha didn't take those presence from that Naaman, I'll go get them for myself. Now, here's, herein is what Jennifer is basically and I getting in the spirit. That there is right now the pride in the individual that's coming against the connecting that God wants to bring. In Colossians 2.18, it says, Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and not holding fast to the head to whom the whole body is joining together by joints and ligaments, grows to the increase that's from God. In other words, what God is saying, I believe, is that the church is not going to be perfect, but God is looking for an adequate witness. Remember, Jennifer doesn't know what an adequate witness is. I don't know what an adequate witness is either, but I know it's not perfect people. They didn't have perfect people in that upper room, but they did gather together in one accord, a group of people at some level, they were in enough peace with God and with one another to become a candidate for the outpouring of God's Spirit. Because ultimately, the prayer of Jesus, which I believe is going to be answered, do you? Father, I pray that they would be one even as you and I are one that the world may believe. Until the world sees some adequate witness of loving one toward another, they're not going to be convinced. And you could say, well, I preach this gospel throughout all the world. All the tribes and all the unknown tribes have been reached. No, even if that happens, unless they see the body of Christ as a character witness of their love one toward another, they're not going to believe. The end will not come. And so I'm, I'm convinced that God is basically saying right now that I'm knitting together and that pride is the only thing that can hinder you from the grace of God, the divine enablement and the ability that he wants to pour out. So let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, which simply translates humility, let each esteem others as better than themselves. And that's why we've been laboring even in the worship services. I don't care... Uh, how gifted of ministries you've sat under your whole Christian life. I'll tell you what, you still have gotten accustomed to going into a corporate setting and being a Lone Ranger. The purpose of a corporate setting is to bear witness that we are going to worship God, but it's our Father. The inability to open your spirit to the people to your left and to your right has been the long-standing problem in the church. God I love, it's these people I'm having a hard time with. That's not going to sail. That ship sinks. God is basically saying, you're going to have to walk in a forgiveness lifestyle to where you can understand that. But you're going to have to know the, the tension between uh, tolerating sin and the patience that allows someone to repent and change. God is basically saying right now, that he gives grace to the humble 
and that it's a time where we put away the boasting. It's not about you doing it. It's not about, we often said, we, we laugh about the donkey on the triumphal entry, bringing Jesus in, and the crowds cheered, laid the garments down, palm branches. I said, so we're like the donkey thing, and it's all about us. No, that's pretty cool. I like all these people cheering me in. No, it isn't about the donkey. It was about who was on the donkey. It was Jesus that was getting all of the accolades. So God's basically saying that we're in a time where we've got to break the pride by either confessing our faults one to another so that we can start knitting together the way God knits together, where every part does its share and causes edifying of itself in love. So I want to pray, and for those of you are watching by Ustream, we basically uh, need to understand that the first step is to let God search our heart for that pride. Because remember, there's the pride of superiority, there's the pride of inferiority. Oh, mm -hmm. that's still pride. Poor me, you're not trusting in God, you're just busy beating yourself in false humility, saying what you can't do. Then there's the pride of sophistication. What's the pride of sophistication? It's by association. You know, uh, some people will even go so far as if I can't be famous, I'll be infamous. If I can't be president, I'll shoot the president. You know, sad. Then there's some people who, in and of themselves, if I just associate with the big names or a big name or a big corporation or a big something, then somehow that will transfer to me. That's the pride of sophistication. No, you are a value in and of yourself, and it's about, not about your name tag, and it's not about your association. It's about who you are in the sight of God. And I'm saying that whatever God's doing with us, even in our prayer time facing one another, God is basically saying that he's saying, seek my face, and my heart is saying, your face I will seek. And in the Hebrew, that's basically saying, sink into God, and as you sink into God and seek his presence, that you are groping by reason of touching for that awareness of that reality. We want to press on to a reality of intimacy, to sink into God that we might be clothed, sink into him that we might touch him, that we might grope in the dark. Seek means to, to grope as pertaining to touching his reality. I want to touch his presence. Face to face is actually spirit to spirit. Face to face is his presence. So Father, we just thank you that even this day, insofar as us, we humble ourselves before you and say, God, you search my heart. I'm not going to make excuses. I'm not going to be afraid to face my fears. I'm simply saying, God, on the inside, I humble myself. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. I want the riches that only come from you. I want the honor that only comes from you. And I want the life with a capital L that only comes from you. All of these things the world seeks after, riches, honor, and life. And yet you have provided for all of them through humility. So by humility and honoring you, there are riches, honor, and life. And this day I am opening up to the searching of God's heart and to a new uh, awareness to be bonded together with brothers and sisters interdependently, no longer an independent person and being prideful of it, but rather interdependent and moving to another level in God. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.